Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us today uh, for uh, this webinar, uh, Aging in Place, Caring for Caregivers. Uh, we're very proud to be co-hosting uh, this, uh, this webinar, one in a, a series that we're doing on, uh, on Aging in Place with uh, our, our good friends at HealthWorks. Um, and we're um, very excited to have uh, a couple of them on the line today. Uh, I wanted to start uh, by just doing a, a quick round of uh, introductions um, before we get into the meat of the issues. Um, and for, for that, uh, we'll just do um, who you are, um, uh, what you do, where you work. Uh, and of course, for levity, um, what is the one uh, holiday song that, for good or bad, uh, brings you back uh, <laughs> brings you back to childhood. And I'll start. So um, my name is Tom Castles. I'm the president of Rock Health. Um, I uh, work with the um, uh, venture investment team, uh, the research membership team, and the uh, strategy consulting team here at Rock Health. Uh, and the song that, uh, that brings me back, uh, I grew up in, uh, in the Bronx, which was a really interesting mix of uh, Irish American, Puerto Rican, Greek, um, West Indian, and Italian. And the song that just is an earworm for me is Dominic the Donkey. I'm not sure if anyone outside of New York has suffered this um, this this holiday nightmare, uh, but I have already heard it, and now it will play throughout this entire webinar in my head. Um, why don't we move on um, uh, now to uh, Liz uh, Liz from HealthWorks? Hi. Um, Liz Creter from HealthWorks. Thanks for having us, Tom. Super excited to be here. Um, I work on the commercialization team at HealthWorks. So HealthWorks is the innovation arm of Care First Blue Cross Blue Shield. Um, and then the song that brings me back, this question, it's not my favorite song, but it does bring me to a very specific place. Um, oh, Holy Night. Like I was raised super Catholic. So Oh, Holy Night immediately brings me back to like third angel from the left in like the second grade play is, is where it brings me. So I'm um, very excited to be here. That's, that's a nice year. Um, uh, Alex. Uh, I'm cheating. I'm like looking at my phone, trying to remember the name of my two favorites. And when I think of the second one, I'll tell you. Um, Alexander Drain, CEO, co-founder of Archangel. Super honored to be here. Thank you very, very much for having me. A big fan of Rock Health and obviously madly in love um, with all things health works. And love you, Liz. Becky, so I, um, do they know what's Christmas? because it was the first time I saw anything like that get pulled off. And it was so extraordinary to watch people from all walks of life come together at a moment that felt so dark and, uh, and bring such light and attention and camaraderie and people feeling as though they were um, much more alike than different. And so it's really fitting right now. And maybe we can sing it towards the end together. There you go, if we, if we run short. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. Um, and of course, uh, Liz from Best Buy will lead us in singing that song. <laughs> right now, Liz, do you want to uh, introduce yourself? Sure. Let's start with introductions and we'll do um, talent skill competition later. Okay. Liz Beckius, Best Buy, uh, Human Resources Department have a variety of programs I've been responsible for um, over time, caregiving being a current one. And for me, Jingle Bells is front of mind. Um, it's one of those, I think, Christmas children's classics. You might not know much more than Jingle Bells, Jingle Bells, but that's enough to carry you through and kind of um, boost your spirits. It reminds me of, yeah, so many different children's performances and those kinds of things. Um, yeah, that's just like the first thing that's right at the front of my mind. That's, that's excellent. You're all I'm trying to use your um, positive songs to kill Dominic. 
uh, and uh, Jeff, <laughs> Jeff uh, let's let's end with you. Uh, again, Jeff Brown. Uh, I'm a product manager at HealthWorks, and I, um, I'm going to drop another song here. It's a Silent Night, Holy Night cover, uh, but it's by an artist called Gabi Moreno, and she sings a doo-wop version of it with a really cool beat. Um, it reminds me of my dad and my childhood, listening to all these music on the way home with him. Uh, so that's why I, I bring it up. Okay. Check it out. All right. I hope I have something to check out. Um, and we, in all seriousness, we are going to make Liz sing that song. Um, so uh, if, if you have a heart uh, in the audience, please ask questions so Liz doesn't have to um, show us our skills. Uh, I wanted to lead off just with um, a, a little bit of context on why all of us are here today. Um, some, some very interesting um, data to tell the story of um, caregiving uh, in the United States. Um, from AARP, um, we have data sharing that 87% of people over the age of 65 would prefer um, to age in place, to live in their home uh, and the same community where, um, uh, where they, they have been living. Um, if you look at 50 to 64 year olds, that actually drops to 71%. Uh, and I asked myself, what could be behind that drop? Um, and I think Part of the answer um, is, frankly, um, there is a significant cost to uh, aging in place right now um, that we all have a lot of work to do um, to address. Um, let's take a look at that desire to age in place from the flip side, um, uh, and that is, um, what, what is happening in our country with respect to um, uh, unpaid uh, informal caregiving? Um, the, the CDC released a report in August that paints the picture for where we are today um, and does so um, with uh, a lot of data from, uh, from Alex's organization. Uh, and I wanna share some of that because um, it, it is stark. Um, first of all, 54 million Americans, uh, one in six of all Americans are actively an informal caregiver. Uh, and in, in, in doing so, um, they are accruing roughly $450 million in unpaid work per year. Uh, that doesn't explain um, the breadth and depth of caregiving responsibilities. Um, you'll see a lot of websites uh, that, you know, you have uh, a happy, healthy um, uh, parent or a child uh, and a happy, healthy uh, caregiver. Um, the reality is there's a lot of activities of daily living. Um, there's a lot of clinical coordination there's an awful lot of financial and legal um, proxy work that is being done all by people who are not trained for any of that. Uh, and um, that is creating uh, a serious uh, issue um, with caregivers being much more susceptible to developing chronic illness, acute mental illness, and substance use disorders. In fact, 56% of unpaid caregivers have anxiety or depression, according to the CDC. Um, also, according to the CDC, five, there is a five-time five -time increase in the incidence of substance use um, by uh, uh, informal caregivers versus non-caregivers. Let me repeat that, a five 
times um, greater incidence rate. Um, one in three uh, informal caregivers has thought about suicide uh, in uh, the, in, this is data from the month of June, 2020. One in three of 54 million Americans. Uh, and, you know, there's, there's, you know, some light at the end of the tunnel. There's, there is light at the end of the tunnel. Um, during his campaign, President-elect Biden laid out plans to inv invest roughly $775 billion to boost, um, his words, the caregiver economy. Um, and I think that that is, um, that is probably scratching the surface on what we're going to need to see. Um, these, these statistics, frankly, represent blunt force trauma to every generation. Boomers, Gen X, Millennials, uh, Gen Z. But what we, what we want to kick off today with is an N of one. Um, and, um, and so I'm gonna turn things over uh, to Jeff Brown. Um, Jeff has, um, uh, has agreed to, to actually start by kind of talking about the, the, real, um, uh, the real life impact. Um, the challenges caregivers face, they're just not homogenous. So this is the only way for us to have a real conversation is to start with a real person. So I'm honored to ask Jeff to share his story to kick us off. Thank you. And um, I'm gonna share this, this backstory as context because I, I wanna call out some of the challenges that, um, you know, that informal caregivers do go through. Um, so I'll try to call those out as I go through. Um, so I was a little young, but my midlife crisis started in my 30s uh, when my mother and father were both diagnosed with life-threatening conditions two weeks before I turned 35. My mom found more lumps in her breast, and this time they came back as cancerous, and my dad was taken to the ER suddenly with heart, lung, and kidney failure. I should offer some context that I'm an only child, and my parents at the time lived 800 miles apart from each other. And it's also worth mentioning that I've just been offered a new team to lead at work and along with it, the opportunity to prove myself. So I had to choose. Who could I save or support? My mom, my dad, myself and the job I'd worked so hard to earn. And I feel like I made the right decision. Uh, I chose my dad and I chose him because his condition was urgent and I was all he had. And growing up with divorced parents, he was all I really wanted. So the thing is, his poor health had plagued me since I was in college. Uh, when I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder soon after his second heart attack and a quadruple bypass. Severe stress can trigger all kinds of symptoms, including mania in me. So suffice it to say that mania showed up in full force. But this time in a good way, sort of. It gave me like superhuman energy that I needed and stamina that I needed to keep my father alive and also my job alive until I could claim FMLA leave because I hadn't been there for a year yet. Um, but it also came at great cost to my family and relationships. So when I realized that my dad was going to die uh, in that hospital bed, my wife and I decided to bring him home with us for hospice care. The doctors actually told me that he had two weeks to live and might die on the way home. And um, the only reason I, why I could do this was thankfully a mentor and a friend of my father's had advised me to secure a will and an advanced directive for him years prior so I could make that decision on his behalf. But I still had to get a power of attorney uh, to control other aspects of his life. And I still don't know how I pulled that off. But we made room for him in my basement office so he could have visitors come through the garage and see him while we kept the dog and toddler upstairs. But that was not going to work because we had a coon dog, a coon, coon hound, uh, and she, was, she would go off like an alarm whenever someone would come through the garage. So no one could sleep, and I couldn't work from home. And my team and my mom still needed me, and I needed them. So we put my dad back in his house with a caretaker, and the house wasn't in the best condition, I should call out, because my dad was a collector, uh, to put it nicely. So over the next year or so, I 
wound up separating from my wife and son because of all the stress. Uh, I moved into my dad's house, and thanks to the, the horde that I had unsettled trying to move in, he, my care, the caretaker, and myself all got sick from the mold. And the thing is, like, somehow throughout all this, I managed to do the most creative work of my life. Uh, before I left my job, uh, my dream job, I submitted several inventions and am now a patented inventor because bipolar disorder be like that sometimes. You don't get to decide about when the creativity comes. Um, I can't say that I did everything perfect, but I did the best that I could. And my dad had 13 more months because of the decisions that I made uh, with this care. Um, that said, I was pretty unbearable. And I'll admit that I didn't have the healthiest coping mechanisms, uh, which contributed to the end of my marriage. Um, ultimately, you know, it's hard to talk about this. I miss my dad. I miss that. Um, the conversations with him and it's just it's tough it's tough to balance the priorities at work you know workism in america is very difficult to overcome you feel like you're you're not yourself if you're not working um but i'm grateful for at least the time that i was able to spend with him um over that year tom you're on mute Um, uh, Jeff, thank you so much for, um, actually putting reality to this. Um, we can talk about, we can talk about statistics until, um, uh, the cows come home, but in, in reality, this is, um, uh, and, and a human issue. Um, and I can't, I can't wait to come back uh, to where you are today with Lantern um, later on in the conversation. For, for now, Alex, your personal narrative kind of redirected the work you do in the caregiver economy several times. Can you, can you share a little bit of that narrative um, from Eliza to Archangels today? Yeah. Um, first, I want to say, Jeff, you know, part of what's going to change our culture is talking about the things that are hard. And you being brave and authentic and transparent is a gift for everybody. Thank you. Um, shout out to your papa for raising such a rocking person. And it's, a, it's lucky for all of us that you're here. Thank you. Um, so, and it reminds me also, one of my favorite quotes is Plato, be kind for everyone who's fighting their own hard battle. I'm sure so many people as you were going through this had no idea that you were. And to me, a theme across my, my life has been waking up to that, that everywhere you look, business often believes that people are a certain way, but actually what's going on in their life is very, very, very different. And there's shame and people aren't willing to talk about it. And we think about shame really as a conversation waiting to be had. And, and you're starting that conversation here, thank you. So Eliza was the first time um, that was exposed to me. We were a bootstrapping startup at using technology to interact with people about their health. And we were getting paid to convince people to take care of their diabetes or their cardiovascular disease on a communication platform, population health platform using speech recognition. And what we heard very quickly from people is, um, thank you so much for encouraging me to get a mammogram. I would love to, I can't right now because my mother with Alzheimer's just moved in or I'm afraid my partner's cheating or I hate my job so much I can't breathe. And we heard this so many times that finally we're like, well, maybe that's actually the issue. Maybe those are the biggest diseases in the US, not asthma, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, but in fact, caregiver stress, relationship stress, workplace stress, financial stress. And so we went to work trying to get the data that would convince people to focus on this quite seriously, ask the biggest diseases, so to speak, um, in the country. And we called that movement the unmentionables. And the work that we did to capture the data around it, we called the vulnerability index. And it proved without a doubt that we have to expand the definition of health to include life because when life goes wrong, health does go wrong. We launched that back in 2010. Um, in 2008, in parallel, my sister-in-law was diagnosed with brain cancer on the night that I got hitched to her brother. And although we had done death really well in my family, um, I was you know, in bed with my grandma when she died, she wanted to die at home when she did. And my aunt wanted to die in um, a hospital for a number of reasons. She, she got to do that, we were with her, um, but we did, not, we did a terrible job with my sister-in-law. Terrible, terrible, terrible. Textbook case of overtreatment, she died seven months later spent the last three months in the hospital, 
And we never talked to her about her wishes ever. And that's a crime. And we didn't because it wasn't appropriate or proper in um, her culture. So it wasn't a natural thing to do. And thank gosh, we got her home the night before she died and her beautiful little baby girl, Alessia, who at that point was two and a half and had not really been able to touch or hold her mama when she was in the hospital for the last three months, climbed up in bed, thank you hospice, um, because she was in the comfort of her home and snoogled her mama. And the last thing that Za saw was she opened her eyes and she looked her daughter full in the eyes. And I tell Za, I mean, Alessia to this day, um, you were the last thing your mama saw and she loved a lifetime into you and she's watching over you now but we almost missed that opportunity. And so we started a movement about three years later, we had to get over the post-traumatic stress um, of a bad death. And the movement was all about getting the conversation started. And we have to have the conversation about how to live our best days until our last way before you need to. Start it now, have it tonight with your family and your loved ones. And you can, you can make it fun while well, you do, believe it or not. Um, when I left Eliza, I uh, wanted to work on the overlap between those two things, which was the caregiver, because we kept seeing that if you want to bend trend in the country, what you've got to do is address this caregiver, because being a caregiver is really the epicenter of what we would call life sucks disease. Because if you are a caregiver and, oh my gosh, Jeff, did you just nail it? You get stress at work, financial issues, relationship issues, right? When this goes wrong, everything else associated goes wrong and it goes wrong over a period of time. And the first attempt we did at Archangels um, was a massive failure. And so I had a midlife crisis and decided that I wanted to go work at Walmart because I thought I lived in a bubble and that all these people were talking and talking, but I just didn't really understand what, what outside of the you know, wood paneled conference rooms, how is it going for people? And served as a cashier for 18 months at Walmart, store 2660, shout out to you, North Reading, Walmart, and saw very, very quickly that we had it all wrong that in fact, retail is a front line of health. And here we are trying to engage or coerce or beguile people to come into the healthcare system so we can fix them with our idea of what health is. In fact, health is life. And life is happening out in the aisles of Walmart. And so we should take all those tools and platforms and solutions and bring it out right there and work with people. And Liz, I see you smiling because that's what Best Buy is doing, right? You know that. Um, so in the process of um, you know, getting through all of these learnings, uh, found that I had a brain tumor myself. We did watchful wait, waiting. We believed it was benign, had nine and a half hour brain surgery. Um, in the year following that, that was when we started Archangels Take Two. I just have to share as a funny side story. I did not realize that I had made my man and my beautiful children uh, caregivers themselves. Literally, it took a year for me to like, wait a minute, the complete mess that I was for the six weeks after my brain surgery, that my whole family was like, Oh my God, is she ever going to recover? Is she going to be the same? Um, I just blew right through it and had that wake up moment, which I think Jeff, you have too, of turning around and saying, thank you so much to the people who supported me um, when I was a catastrophe. So Archangels Take Two really came to life in that moment. I'm going to give you just reinforce the data, Tom, that you shared, which is what inspired us, has inspired us. And you mentioned 54 million, Tom, that was pre-COVID. And I can tell you that Archangel's additional data that we did, a full 61% of the population right now, if you say, are you caring for the health of a loved one, family member, neighbor, or friend, will say yes, 55% will say that it's new. And so Archangel's is a platform that uses a combination of data and stories to reframe how caregivers are seen, honored, and supported. And the first thing you gotta do in reframing is you gotta make it okay for people to talk about it, and they gotta lift those people up, you gotta celebrate the caregivers, and then you gotta address the very real issues that are driving a number, like one in three of contemplated suicide in the month of June. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm kind of uh, not looking forward to seeing the updated data. Um, because frankly, the, the trend is, um, uh, as a caregiver myself right now, um, things, things are trending very hard. Um, you know, I think one of the things, um, that makes me optimistic is, um, that along with the people that are around me, um, employers are really leaning into the caregiver crisis and with good reason. Um, frankly, unpaid caregivers with full or part-time jobs spend 20 plus extra hours a week caring for loved ones and 80% report uh, their dual roles impact 
productivity. And as Jess, Jeff said before, you know, your greatest work can uh, and creativity can come at any time. But if you are blocked um, on, on all sides, um, that can make it impossible uh, to, to do your best work. So uh, Liz from Best Buy, since we have two Liz's, um, uh, can you tell us uh, a little bit about the big picture themes underway and evolving at Best Buy to help support caregivers? Yeah, thank you so much, Tom, um, for inviting me into this conversation. It, it is um, a challenge. We are pulled as an employer, uh, you know, in a similar way to the caregivers that we have a business to run, we have customers um, that need to be served with supply chain, uh, distribution centers, right? And without our employees there, um, and, and they're in a dependable way, you know, we're unable to do kind of our job as an employer. Um, but we've become very honest about those employees showing up who are torn between do I choose a third attendance occurrence or do I stay home with my potentially dying loved one? That's a terrible, terrible place for anybody to be. And they're not productive. They're not in a good place to do good work um, when pressed into those kinds of tough corners. And so we've... Um, been very honest about um, caregiving looks, lots of different things. Um, caregiving needs, lots of different things. Um, it's not always that the employee needs a leave of absence and we need to just get them out of the building. Um, sometimes being at work can be the rest or the reprieve or um, kind of the escape that is really so essential for them to be able to get back to the work of being the caregiver. Um, and so rather than trying to push our employees into um, a box of what being a caregiver looks like, we really try to provide a portfolio of opportunities and options. How can we help um, give them some space to do the things they need to do themselves, how the care they need to provide themselves, and then some resources and services where they um, have support to, in a way, outsource some of the tasks, right? There are some things that are best left to others and other activities you're like, I need to do this myself. I'm not comfortable um, kind of putting this out um, into a support network. Um, the other thing that we really try to be thoughtful about um, is how do we kind of retool or re-represent or, or brand or market what we currently offer in a way that is supportive. And um, we've talked about that caregiving is in, inclusive of financial and legal and emotional some um, kind of impacts almost every um, employer is going to offer an employee assistance plan, an EAP. How can we communicate in a way that's easy for those caregivers to understand? Ah, I have a pain point and I can see myself in the solution you're presenting. Uh, we don't want to try to um, have a portfolio of forks that really aren't a good spoon or a good fork, right? We don't, we don't want multitaskers that are ineffective in every landscape, but how do we take what we have, um, prepaid legal plans and other kinds of resources that, that in a quality way can serve a wide variety of needs, um, but you really have to make it easy for those caregivers to understand the value. They don't have the capacity to dig through the HR resource pages and try to translate, how is this benefit or tool or resource actually helpful for me and not just more work because I don't need more work. I have no capacity for more work, make it easy for me. Um, and then I think the last piece that we're, we're being thoughtful about is the time. Um, not everybody is ready for um, every kind of tool or support or resource when maybe we think they are. We have to kind of be prepared to meet the employee where they're at in that journey. Um, you know, initial diagnosis or the onset of a new condition. Um, sometimes, you know, the employee needs a little time to process and to understand where they're at and what they can do um, and come around to those needs. So to, to be patient and to meet the employee when they're ready at the place that they're at with a variety of resources really has been um, the most successful. But being very open um, in caregiving can be so many things, child, ongoing illness, acute events, um, even even current state with um, a lot of schools being shut down and those kinds of things, that's, that's caregiving too. And that's a whole new level um, of need for how do I, what do I do and what do I outsource? Where do I bring in help? Um, or where do I just need a little capacity, a little bit of grace for my employer um, to have the space to take care of that? 
and manage it. And then I'm back and I'm better than ever. Yeah. And, you know, something that we, we had discussed um, the other day, and Jeff, I might ask you to um, weigh in here as well as Liz, is how you kind of walk the, walk the tight rope between trying to help people solve um, or address their problems versus making offers to solve problems for your employees. You know, it, it, it's, that's, that's a tough, um, that's a tough spot to know what is too much. Um, I don't know, Liz, Jeff, do you have, uh, Alex, uh, do, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I can, I can start. I would say um, it's deeply related to so many other um, kind of those unmentionals of it that Alex mentioned, right? If it's mental health or even some personal health conditions, um, understanding all of us only have so much reach. Um, there's only so much you can do to get to a person if it's a drug addiction or if you see them struggling, whatever the struggle is, there's only so much we can each do as kind of onlookers. So we try to be really honest with our managers about that reach. Um, but what we can do is create an environment that is supportive, that is welcoming, that is a helpful environment. Um, so again, all these topics are so interrelated. How are we talking about caregiving internally? such that to have the conversation with your manager to say, you know what, I need a little space because my mom fell and like, I just have to cancel all my meetings today and address this urgent issue. How do we make those conversations more acceptable, more comfortable? They're always gonna be scary, but really creating that safe environment is I would say step number and priority number one. Um, having employees, you know, like Jeff, but have those employees internally to share um, their experiences makes big headway. Um, and then it just generally, how is our culture supportive of the realities of all the personal stuff we bring to work, be it financial, legal, caregiving, mental health. Let's be real, that all comes with us. Um, and how do we just really have humility and vulnerability with our employees so that they can speak up for what they need, be helpful in the environment. Liz, um, I'm going to jump in after that because I, I love so much of what you just said. And it's something that I think you said and has been said a couple of times is when somebody tells you that they're a caregiver, like it's an N of one. So you now know one thing about them. You know that they're a caregiver and you don't have any idea what the other things they're bringing to the table, what they're dealing with and what they're not dealing with and like what actually constitutes a problem for them because they might be spending 20 hours a week outside of work, but maybe they don't see that as a burden. So you then telling them it's a burden, that's a non-starter. You've completely shut down the conversation. So being humble enough to like ask those questions and listen to where they actually need you to step in and not thinking that you know they're a caregiver, so now you completely understand their life and you completely know how to solve their problems. So it's about giving them the space and listening to what they actually bring to the table and what they're actually saying they need help with. Oh, Jeff. I might add something as well, if I could. Yeah. Uh, in my in my case, I did go out on short term disability. Uh, the benefits coordinator for my company, uh, you know, gave me that benefit along with the FMLA benefit. And one of the things that I missed so much was just interacting with my with my team. You know, so th I know that there are some rules about this when someone goes out on disability that uh, the team can't reach out. You know, you have to come to them. So it's sort of like there there are there are legacy systems and and things that that sort of uh, interfere with getting the support that you need. And given that we spend so much time at work, the relationships that you have with your colleagues are uh, you know, maybe for some people, and they were for me, uh, really important. Yeah, I, I would just add really quickly, I, I think the point about, re, you know, most employers have an EAP. They have resources that exist. But the EAP, most employees are like, I don't need that. I'm not doing that. There's a stigma associated with it. So you really do go back to your organization, unbundle what you have and rebrand it. Because if you, what you say is we can help you with financial services, we can help you with legal assistance, we can help you find a place for your mom to go during the day so you can come to work, whatever it might be. The other thing I just want to remind all of us, this is enormous fluidity right now for caregivers in particular, but they can't, they can't stay at their job. 
So we also need to be supporting folks to remind them, you know, A, let us help you stay at work. And B, if you do need to, you know, take a leave, per, hopefully not permanently, here are resources that exist in the community. And the other thing I would say, which I think is really important, um, some of our other data shows that just knowing someone is looking out for you, that you have one person you can turn to, 40% reduction in depression, 30% reduction in anxiety. And just knowing that respite services exist, even if you don't use them, 70% reduction in stress. And so what I'd say to anyone here who knows anyone who's a caregiver, one of the other mantras we say is don't ask, just help. Because telling somebody, I'll be there for you, I'll be your person. My dad um, just had a humongous health scare. And even though I work in the caregiving space and I knew this was Monday night, when, it, when I got the call, I lost my, I literally, my, my entire brain went blank. I had no idea what to do. I was like, I stood up and I walked around crying, sobbing, like I can't remember what to do. What am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to do? And what I did was I thought of that one person I'm supposed to call and I called that one person and they walked me through the next step and the next step. So everybody find your person, tell that person they're your person, they're your archangel, get your archangel. Um, and last thing I want to add really quickly, the reason we call it an archangel, we don't use the term caregiver. Archangels are warrior angels. These caregivers are fierce. They're warriors on your behalf. Um, and a vision of like wrapping your wings around someone to care for them through it. That helps make this aspirational. Archangels are superstars, superhuman energy, Jeff. You bring it, we all bring it when we need to for the ones that we love. And that's an aspirational vision that we should have that lifts people up. Um, I couldn't agree more. Um, I actually have a question um, from the audience and from a very sharp, sharp audience member, Molly Coy, um, for Liz um, from Best Buy. Uh, uh, Molly asked, your comments uh, about training frontline managers are really helpful. Are they directly backed up by EAP or how do you organize the kind of overall panoply of services and support? Sure. Um, someone else had made a comment in the chat there too about a guide. So we, we did um, put together, you know, an, a comprehensive resource that takes all those different programs and services and other stuff. Like some of it is really high level with just a small tease of what is a, a healthcare directive? What is um, power of attorney? What, just a, just a little snip, right? Like we don't need to give you you know, a whole legal dissertation on it, but no, just, just a taste so that you might be intrigued enough to know it's something you should look into or not, or where, where am I at in my journey? So just little, little bits of information. Um, what does it mean to, and then some different kind of common um, kind of needs maybe. So we have the resource, um, so that's one. And then I would say our frontline managers um, definitely have a lot of training and information around just general support, how to be supportive, and then that redirect, because they're not the experts, for sure. Um, HR is a big, big, big part of that, too. I would say there's a lot of situations where the employee and the manager have um, a close connection, and then that manager is kind of getting, getting the, oh, wow, um, a little bit of kind of um, Alex's response, like, oh, crap, I'm I'm kind of in a panic. I'm not sure what to do now. Um, and so their supporter tends to be our HR managers. And then those HR managers are a little better equipped to kind of go through the operation. Like, what do we do next? What should we, what steps do we need to take? Um, and then really looking to those third party, like the EAPs and the legal plans to help with the more tactical assistance, um, the different support type programs. So it kind of goes employee, manager, HR, um, because those HR managers have a good sense of all of the resources at their fingertips, the leave of absence, the caregiver leaves, the et cetera. Yeah, um, I think uh, one of the tools that um, uh, all of us have s spoken about and uh, Jeff and Liz from HealthWorks uh, are, are working on right now is a tool called Lantern. Um, Liz from HealthWorks, can you tell us um, the origin story of Lantern and how you're using human-centered design um, to, to kind of shape a tool set that you're bringing to the employer market? 
Yeah, absolutely. I would love to. And Lantern is something we've been working on for the better part of this year. So I mean, how much time you got? We could talk about this for the next five hours because it's just something we've spent so much time thinking about and, and working with. Uh, at the beginning of this year, we really, um, commercialization is really interesting and fun because we get to basically go into this completely open space and think about what are the big problems we really want to solve and why. And we, were, we talked to a bunch of really smart people across the healthcare industry. Uh, and we look at trends and we look at all of this data. And what kept coming out to us were a couple of things that were really interesting. Um, the first of which being that America is quickly aging and there are a lot of issues and problems that pop up as people age that the healthcare system isn't really well equipped to solve. And there's that other idea of what are the gaps in the healthcare system. And right at the intersection of that, caregivers kept coming up, like, like without fail. Because where aging folks fall into the gap, caregivers pick it up, but it was not something that as a healthcare system, we are well set up to acknowledge or really support them in any way. So we thought that was really interesting. Um, we run through our process and you come up with a, a lot of ideas in a lot of different areas and you proceed to sort of cut down and whittle down. And one of the frames that we always look at when we're looking at new solutions that we really want to invest in is this idea of impact. So how could we do the most good for the most people, um, both from how many people can we get to, to use and really invest in something like this, but how deeply is it going to infect, affect them? And I mean, we've talked again and again about how, how deeply caregivers are affected by their situation, how, how deeply it affects every piece of their life. So that was another big win uh, for caregiving as an area that we were going to, to really start to look into. Um, and I think for me, the light bulb moment where I really knew we had something was when we were testing a couple of these solutions and we were testing a wellness solution with, with folks. Um, and people kept coming back with, this is great, but I don't have time to use this because I'm busy over here taking care of everybody else. Um, so just the idea that like, no matter what we were testing, we kept coming back to caregiving, uh, really told us it was something we should move forward with. And then human-centered design is such an important part of how we solve problems because it is the same humility that we've talked about you know, time and time again of, we're not gonna tell you what your problems are. We're not gonna tell you what we're gonna solve for you. We're gonna talk to hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of caregivers and employers because we recognize that employers were a huge part of solving this problem. And we're gonna figure out what it is they want us to solve and continue to work with them for months to figure out what the exact place and the exact way that we need to start intervening is. Um, so given all of that work, we have finally gotten to our, our caregiver solution, uh, which we are beginning to test and, and put in people's hands by Q1 of next year, uh, which is called Lantern, which really hits on all of these areas of, of not just how do we help people navigate through healthcare, but also how do we help people navigate through finance and also just how do we give people a personal resource that's just going to be there for them when things get really scary and hard because things get really scary and hard in caregiving. Yeah, I think, Jeff, I'd love to, to hear, um, since, your, uh, since your role is, um, is, is uh, running Lantern, um, love to hear your, your take on where things are and where you hope to, to, to move with it. Sure. So I should also specify that I've just recently joined the team, so I get to, uh, to, to lead a team that's been working on this for some time, like Liz mentioned. Um, where, where things are, well, I, I won't give away too much of the secret sauce, but, um, <laughs> but they're in an exciting place. Uh, you know, we mentioned the question about human centered design. There's, there's so much to having empathy for a person. You know, I think we mentioned earlier about, um, when you come to help and just showing up and it's, you know, when people show up like that, you have the awareness that the person going through it might not have. And one of the activities that we go through in human-centered design is just a, a map of the journey or the path that someone's going through as they, as they address this challenge. And so much comes out of just being present, you know, being present and aware and walking with someone as they're being, as they're going through a crisis. Like, for example, we've, you know, some of us have gone through. So it's exciting to, to, to take this challenge on. Um, I'm looking forward to testing some of what we've come up with and, in Q1, and uh, maybe some of you all can uh, participate. No, that's, um, I think that's, if, at least from the chat, it sounds like there's a lot of uh, excitement. Um, you know, I, I think um, there, there are a couple of questions um, that, uh, that are coming in, and I want to get to them, um, but I do want to ask one question 
um, to everyone on the panel, and I don't want to I don't want to miss this. Um, ultimately, you know, Lantern, um, some of the uh, tools and uh, and and processes that Liz from Best Buy talked about, um, uh, you know, frankly, they're never going to be fully baked. Um, the, the human condition is far too complicated um, for us to solve problems like the ones that caregivers face. Um, you know, yet as, as humble as everybody has been on this call today um, uh, about providing tools, not solutions, um, to help others own their challenges, we're also optimistic. So, you know, the question that I, this is my question in the Q&A, um, uh, can each of you tell me what makes you most optimistic about the future of caregiving? And maybe what advice do you have for digital health entrepreneurs thinking about adding to the caregiver toolkit? Um, and maybe we can start with um, Liz from HealthWorks. Sorry to put you on the spot, Liz. No, no, it's a good question. Um, so it's a, it's a really good question. And if you could repeat, because I got really stuck on like the last part. Can you repeat that first part again real quick? Yeah. What makes you most optimistic about the future of caregiving? Yeah. I think what makes me the most optimistic about the future of caregiving is conversations like this. Um, it's the fact that when we want to talk to other really smart people about caregiving, uh, it's not hard to get on the phone for that conversation because it's something that a lot of really part, smart people are thinking about right now, um, which I don't think maybe was true a year, or year and a half ago. I think it would have been harder to make that sort of sales pitch as to why we should be supporting caregivers. Um, but since definitely since the onset of COVID, it's been much easier to have this conversation with people around why it's important to uh, support caregivers. So just the enthusiasm that people are now bringing to it and all of the plethora of great data coming out of places like Archangels um, and AARP around, you know, just how pressing this concern is, um, I think it's really made this an easier conversation to have. Um, and then for new, new folks entering the space and trying to, to solve for it, I would say, um, listen, like listen to what everyone's saying, listen to, to all of the people who have been working in the space prior and also, uh, try to come at it both from a human centered standpoint, because I think that's, that's a really a way that we believe in solving problems, but also with the idea of cultural competency, because what's important to caregivers and how people show up in caregiving varies across cultures. Um, so you really should be thinking about making solutions that aren't, you know, for one type of person, but can support people across different cultures. Yeah, and, that, and, and that's something you're starting to see, frankly, culturally competent care, uh, coming forth in primary care and, and um, uh, mental health uh, care, you, you know, we can, we can look at this from the perspective of caregivers as well. Alex, how about, how about you? So um, I'm with you, Liz, see, like how much time do you have? Um, so I think a couple quick things. Number one, you know, obviously this is rock health and we're here about technology and we're here to talk about um, the ways that we currently think about growing business. And the first thing I would say um, is for me personally, I think the next big industry is love. And that makes people uncomfortable sometimes, uh, but I think it really is. And if you listen to all the stories, the common thread amongst all of this is how we care for each other and how we are cared for ourselves. So, and I do believe that love can be productized. And I do believe that there's a top and a bottom line. I think it comes down to trust and relationships and authenticity. And when people show up in environments that have that, their health will change. And when they bring themselves with that, then they can help change other people's um, health. So technology plays a role in my world of supporting the building and nurturing of those relationships and in people being able to be honest about who they are and in us seeing them regardless. Um, so, you know, the, the, when I said earlier, I think one of the most supportive things, one of the most protective to help us with resilience, to help us have health, is to have a person that we can go to. So I would just remind all of us, like be an archangel yourself, have an archangel, identify who that archangel is. It could be a peer. It could be, you know, some of the most valuable assets right now in the world are community health workers, social workers, care managers, 
people who are out in the community, they know these stories. They're not locked away in a corporate headquarters somewhere. They're out there with people crying to them every single day. They're trying to figure out how to make money, how to pay their rent. And so find a person like that because, and, and if you're an employer, employ people like that, health plan, employ people like that, because they know stories like Jeff's are everywhere and they're gonna bring that reality what they're doing. Um, and the last thing I would say is consider revenue as your best investor. I just know that all the ideas I've ever had in my life have been wrong. And I thought they were awesome. And if I had money, then I would have gone and built them. But because we've never had money because we're bootstrappers, then we go out to try and get people to pay us. And people are like, that's stupid. And I'm not going to do it. Whether that's a customer or the customer's customer. So just consider, get, expose yourselves to the element as entrepreneurs as fast as you can. Make sure somebody thinks your idea is as awesome as it sounds to you um, wherever you're working. Because I can tell you, I've always been wrong. Um, uh, I'm a hundred percent certain that that isn't true. Uh, Liz from Best Buy, um, how about you? So for me, the optimism or the hope of the future, it's a little double-edged sword about how many caregivers we have, right? Like it's heartbreaking how many people are in caregiving roles. However, um, those have power. Um, to Liz's point about hosting events like this or searching for champions within your business to, you know, make this a priority. The more caregivers there are, the more opportunities there are for people who are going to be champions and are going to back you what are going to put in that sweat equity to make it better. Um, there are so many stories about, you know, startup CEOs or whatever, where they lived it, right? Like they've lived through the pain and they want to help others. So my hope is that there are so many, so many out there that are in a position to drive the success or to make the change. Um, additionally, the number of, um, you know, un, unpaid, right, that some, also gives me optimism um, is a little bit about our culture as a country and that we are caring for each other. And um, I think there's a lot of heartbreaking stories about, you know, the lack of elders moving in with family, but I, I think some of that is changing. I think we're kind of turning a corner a little bit on on how we care for our um, our the ill or our elderly, and and I'm I'm hopeful that as we bring those very painful situations in, um, it's really the best for us and it's the best for that loved one. Um, the kind of the risk or um, the potential impact is then our ability to continue to maintain employment. Um, you know, how we can't be expected to help. Um, so that's kind of, that's my fear a little bit is how are these um, family caregivers then able to maintain um, or sustain having mom move in and maintain solid employment because both somehow are kind of necessary. Um, so then the word, the word of the wise to entrepreneurs is, is how, how do you help? Um, how do you really understand the role of the employer? How do you understand the pain point of the employee? That's where I'm at, right? So that's that's my context. But how do you make this something that's really going to help me as an employer balance those needs so that I can have successful, engaged, productive employees who are healthy, whole humans doing great things for their hearts by caring for their loved ones? Um, it's kind of that issue about, you know, don't design a fork that's trying to serve everybody's needs and it serves none well, um, but it does need to be flexible enough so that when I purchase a solution, I don't, I don't see it as solving a few problems, but it can, it can really be a large impact to make my employees better. And as a business, we're more successful. It needs to be able to do both. Thank you. Jeff, we've, um, we've asked a lot from you, but I'll ask you this one last time. Um, what, what are, what makes you most optimistic? Um, and, and what, what advice uh, do you have going forward? Yeah, I just want to echo uh, some of the great comments from my, my colleagues here. Liz um, and Alex mentioned uh, that the opportunity, well, the opportunity is enormous. We are at the precipice of what's going to be a landslide here with the boomers uh, and their boomers aging. Uh, my father passed a little bit earlier than the average life expectancy in this country. Uh, but we're going to have a lot of opportunity as a result, you know, to, to experiment and iterate on solutions. 
Um, as a technologist and as an inventor, one of the things that gets me so, uh, so excited and enthusiastic about solving this problem uh, is, is the tools that we have now. You know, these things are extremely powerful and, uh, and sophisticated. And the idea of like, um, another thing that gets me excited is like a personal cloud. You know, it's not just the cloud that we have uh, for services like, you know, email and, and productivity, but like the cloud that you carry. I've got these Bluetooth earbuds. I have, you know, other fitness devices and all those things feed us more data, which we can use to, you know, design more solutions and learn more about people uh, and, and the things that they're going through. So, you know, why am I enthusiastic? It's the intersection of opportunity with, uh, with technology, really. Uh, you know, I, um, I share your optimism. Um, I think, you know, just looking at, um, s s there are so many questions, um, and, and I'm sorry that we aren't able to get to all of them. There are questions about, you know, what can we do to actually um, reimburse uh, these uh, these caregivers? What can what kind of um, changes that are taking place right now for supplemental benefits being covered um, in Medicare? Can we expand into the commercial marketplace? Um, you know, I, I think also um, just asking questions about can we um, can we make a huge um, uh, strategic partnership between geriatric care managers, pediatric care managers, and informal caregivers in a way that we haven't before? Um, you know, I, I, we we don't have time to to answer those questions today, but. It's so exciting to see um, this group of people that have been kind enough to um, uh, to to spend uh, an hour with us today. Um, uh, you know, really pushing um, the the audience to have some great great questions that, frankly. Rock Health and uh, HealthWorks and uh, Archangels and Best Buy, we're all collectively going to continue this dialogue about what what uh, what is in our arsenal to um, to tackle these challenges um, because they're going to be the challenges of every one of us. I feel like, uh, and um, and and so uh, I'll close today. Um, Huge thank you, um, Liz, Alex, Liz, Jeff. Um, this was probably um, the the thing in, in 2020 I've been most looking forward to this conversation, uh, and I'm just um, really humbled to uh, have been able to be a, a small part of it. So thank you. Yeah, I just want to second really quickly. You know, for Health Works, for Care First, Liz and Jeff. When you guys invest in things like this, when you support Rock Health having conversations like this, when you allow Archangels to come and harass you the way that you do, um, that's how change happens, right? Because people stand up about something and they get started on it. And you guys have, and I'm really grateful to you for that. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you all. And have, uh, have, have a great day and a happy and peaceful holiday season. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye now. Thank you all.